marketing and uh, committee for this um, event for um, inviting me. Uh, so today uh, I'll um, share with you our work on lupus nephritis in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's based on uh, research that we did and published in 2019. Uh, at the same time, also we will highlight a little bit on some of the some of some of the updates in management and diagnosis of uh, lupus nephritis. So the objectives um, to explore the pattern of practice. Um, of management of lupus nephritis in uh, Saudi, uh, among nephrologists in Saudi Arabia to assist the remission. Yeah, okay. yeah. thank you, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, assist the remission rate among patients treated for proliferative lupus nephritis in Saudi Arabia and assist the long-term outcomes. So we did uh, research looking at the 10 years follow-up of patients treated for lupus nephritis and then briefly review some of the updates in the diagnosis and management of uh, lupus nephritis. So as an introduction, as we know, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus um, affects uh, kidneys commonly. 18 up to 100% of patients will have evidence of um, renal involvement. It can be very minimal, like abnormal urinalysis, that's asymptomatic, or it can be a florid picture of renal failure. Proliferative lupus nephritis, among all lupus effect on the kidney, is the one associated with increased mortality highest mortality and decreased long-term renal survival and need of dialysis. And therefore, aggressive treatment for this form of lupus involvement in the kidney um, should be um, uh, uh, or is suggested. A more favorable outcome among white populations is um, reported in literature. And the disease among more or multi-ethnic groups tend to be more severe and not much is really known about lupus nephritis effect or uh, impact in our uh, population. Also, the value of partial remission on the long-term outcomes had been reported variably in some researches, so we did this research to address all these points. So we screened all kidney biopsies reporting lupus nephritis over 11 years from 2006 up to 2017, and we collected data on biopsy details, induction treatment, remission, and we used the six-month definition for remission, and we looked at the long-term outcomes, including mortality, doubling of serum creatinine, and need for dialysis. We aim to investigate the pattern of practice, how people choose, or what kind of choice for induction treatment, we looked at the remission rate, the short-term effect, and long-term, as I said. The uh, remission was, we used this definition, but mostly, honestly, the ones available in the data was based on the protein level. So we defined complete response as normalization of kidney function, or 50% reduction in serum creatinine from baseline, and a reduction of proteinuria by more than 50% to a level that is less than nephrotic range. The partial remission is reduction in proteinuria, but less than 50% reduction was the main um, um, variable to define partial, and no remission is none of them being fulfilled. So we found 143 kidney biopsies, um, lupus nephritis, from four voluntary participation for centers in Saudi Arabia, one from Riyadh, one from Taif, and two from Jeddah. And among them, 40 were uh, mesangial or non-proliferative classes, like class two, class five, and class six. So we ended ha up having 103 biopsies. And this is first biopsy, not repeat biopsy. Seven were excluded because of lack of data on induction treatment or on remission, or one patient actually had severe multisystem disease, was not treated, and uh, died. So the final sample was 96 biopsies, or cases, and we found that 41 out of 96 treated with cyclophosphamide, MMF 45 patients, and others were 10 patients. 
So we define the cases um, into proliferative and non-proliferative membranes. We wanted to report these two forms, proliferative, which is the one I'm presenting today, 96 patients, 80% of patients, and they are class three or class four, or either of them with class five, so the mixed, uh, mixed form, three and five or th four or five, fa four and five. And we have 24 biopsies on membranes, which we did not report, but we are planning and we're collecting more data. We want to increase the sample. So we will talk about proliferative lupus nephritis, 96 patients from four centers in Saudi Arabia. So the first thing is the remission and the long-term outcomes. Um, sorry, first, so sample 96 and, and the follow-up, yes, it was six month minimum follow-up for any uh, patient and extend up to 11 years. So at baseline characteristic, you find age, median age is 27, majority are women as expected, 85%, and majority are Saudi, 80% and the um, duration of lupus before the biopsy was 27 months. And we know lupus nephritis, if it develop, usually develop early in the course of uh, SLE, most of the time within six to 36 months. The clinical presentation of lupus nephritis, um, hypertension was found in about 42%. Anemia with hematic release and 35 in majority, 82%. Elevated creatinine in above 133 in one-third of cases, 32%. Or EGFR reduction, less than 60 in one-third of patients. Nephrotic range proteinuria was found in 37 patients. And hemodialysis need within six months. So severe disease requiring hemodialysis early within six months. It was in about um, um, five, they were chronic dialysis and two were transient, and they improved with treatment, and four, they required dialysis, but they were lost to follow-up. So 11 patients required dialysis at initial presentation or within six months. The mean albumin level was 23, and the mean serum creatinine was 88, and the mean urine protein in gram was 2.5 gram, so subnephrotic. The breast C3, 84%, the breast C4, 65%. Biopsy finding, class four was the most common, 63% of cases, followed by class three, 22% of cases, and 15% was the mixed, either three or four plus five. We're not studying five, five was excluded. So the fo we have, and if you define it focal or diffuse, so three and three plus five, that's the focal. Diffuse, that is four or four and five. So the most common is diffuse, 73% of cases. We also looked at the biopsy finding, looking at segmental versus global for the one reported. The majority was global disease, but I excluded this from the analysis because the more recent guidelines suggested that they have no impact on the prognosis or even in the treatment. And we also found the same thing, that they don't really impact the prognosis. The disease was mostly active. 66% of cases have active, and the remaining majority are active plus chronic. So activity was common. Only two patients has purely chronic, no activity there. And that's a good reflection of early diagnosis or early biopsy. So the trend is, is good. So in terms of treatment, if, you, if we divide, if, as I said, almost like 40, actually 41 patients treated with cyclophosphamide, cyclophosphamide, and the other arm, which is MMF, 45, and then the third arm, 10 patients treated with other agents, like azathioprine or rituximab, multi-target therapy, there's only few patients. The majority, actually, the azathioprine were from the university hospital. And what we found that there is a tendency to use cyclophosphamide for more severe disease among nephrologists or rheumatologists or the combined team. So those cyclophosphamide, they tend to have more hypertension, lower hemoglobin, as you can see, albumin, almost the same, but creatinine 101 compared to 80, and 
renal failure with creatinine above 133, 16 patients with 40% compared to 33. Urine protein level 3.5 gram compared to MMF, they use 1.9 gram. And the class also diffuse, more diffuse, 40 patients who have diffuse disease compared to only, I mean, and only one focal in the cyclophosphamide group, where in the other group, in the MMF, they are more um, equal. So nephrologists tend to use cyclophosphamide for more severe disease. So with higher creatinine, more proteinuria, more diffuse disease, more active, and so on. So as you can see in this figure, um, for class three, RIT is the MMF. So MMF was the major medication used. And the green is the cyclophosphamide, so it's more used for class four, including both mixed and uh, a single disorder or single lesion. For all cases, as I said, 43% used cyclophosphamide, 47% used MMF, and 10% used other agents. So you're going to compare between the two groups. And before that, the time trend, I looked at the time trend, what has changed over 10 years. And I actually took the 2012 as a cutoff point. It was the time where we had more or re, um, a new guidelines um, advocating for MMF use more. So the, with the induction treatment, if you look in 2006, and then going forward to 2017, there's increased use of um, MMF from 42% to 58%, and, a red, and a less use of cyclophosphamide. But it's still, it's a good number. So 45 down to 39. And less use of uh, other agents like azathioprine or uh, rituximab. And rituximab actually is, is only a few cases, and it was as a primary induction for Ferris presentation and is more recent, um, uh, recently used. Another important point was the uh, theorem creatine at presentation. It's interesting that patients diagnosed early, they have creatine 97, more recent diagnosis at creatine 66, which, uh, which indicate improved uh, practice. So biopsies early. Now remission rate. So clinical remission at six months, five minutes. Complete remission, so all remission 67%. Complete remission in almost 40%, which is similar to uh, maybe even better from uh, other uh, data. So almost two thirds of patients will go into remission. So remission by class, the focal remit more as expected, 81% compared to 61. And by induction, we found MMF group remission is higher, 80% compared to 54. But remember, the cyclophosphamide group were more severe disease. The predictors, the univariate analysis, looking at predictors of remission, we found a number of factors, including creatinine at presentation, the class, diffuse versus focal, and the activity, as well as induction treatment. So MMF remission higher, diffuse remission is higher, and activity, more active disease remit higher, and lower creatine remit higher. But with adjusted analysis, only the activity was found to be an independent predictor of remission. Looking at the long-term outcomes, um, patient survival at last follow-up, 95% of patients were alive. Renal survival, 16% were on dialysis by 10 years or 11 years. And the composite renal outcome of long-term dialysis after six months, relapse or doubling serum creatinine was 30%. So 30% will develop either dialysis, relapse, or doubling serum creatinine. Doubling serum creatinine, 23% of cases, which is a, a good surrogate marker or predictor for dialysis. So this is the Kaplan-Meier curve showing you the survival without doubling serum creatinine decline over years, 23% by 120 uh, months um, are surviving without doubling serum creatinine. Sorry, are the one with doubling serum creatinine. So comparison of long-term outcomes based on remission, and only one, one thing interesting, whether complete or partial remission here, they achieved 
excellent outcome. I mean, patient survival, 100% to 96% between complete and partial. Renal survival, 95, 96%. Composite renal outcomes, 11, 33%. Not statistically significantly different between complete and partial remission, but both of them are much better than no remission. So even partial remission confer long-term advantage or benefit. Survival without doubling serum creatinine based on remission, as you can see. Oh, I don't know how to go back. Yeah. So um, as you can see, 90% of cases, survival without doubling serum creatinine at complete remission, and 78% at partial remission, p-value is not significant, and no remission, 43%. Mortality, five patients died, 5.2%, huh? and all were women, uh, three Saudis, all before 2012, and all had diffuse disease, induction, no difference, two cyclo, two MMF, one CNI, and all, or majority, four had no remission at all, and one has partial remission, so complete remission, no mortality. And four of them actually died when they are on dialysis. And the cause was sepsis in three, active relapse, multi-system disease in one, and post-cardiac surgery in the other one, and it was on dialysis also. So mortality was not different between MMF and cyclophosphamide. So, to conclude, we had more severe disease course. If you compare to, I mean, compared to European or white population, if you compare to Moroni et al. from Italy, data in the serial disease at 10 years, 6%, and we have um, 16%. Doubling serum creatine, 15%, we have 23%. However, our data compared to a more multi-ethnic groups like in the US, we also perform maybe the same, maybe even better in some uh, data. So remission, as we said, two-thirds. 40% is complete, more with active disease, and tendency to a better remission rate with MMF. MMF appears to have similar efficacy in inducing remission and better option for long-term outcomes. Some limitations, like any research, like any retrospective study, we didn't look at the um, doses and the regimen. So there are some limitations with this study. This was published in the Lupus in 2019. And we think this is the first and is a large uh, national data. There is larger national data on lupus from rheumatology groups, but this one is focusing more on lupus nephritis remission and long-term outcomes. So multi-center and long-term outcome data was uh, another strength. I think if there's not enough time, I would just... One minute, one minute. Okay. So the role of kidney biopsy, some of the role of kidney... Maybe I'll move because of the time. Uh, treatment. So what is new in the treatment? The standard of care for lupus nephritis treatment, induction treatment is, of course, a steroid. IV, usually you start with IV and then you go to oral, but IV or oral. And there's no standard uh, or a concrete recommendation on the dosing and the duration for the steroid. And you add to it the uh, induction, the cyclophosphamide, the NIH protocol, the urolupus lower dose, or the oral. That's one arm, and the second, or, or that's one um, choice or the alternative to use MMF. And currently, low dose cyclophosphamide or MMF may be considered the acceptable option. Most people go for low dose cyclophosphamide or MMF. And low dose, I mean the euro lupus. And the use of um, higher dose cyclophosphamide or oral is reserved for more resistant and more severe cases, especially if you haven't used cyclophosphamide before with more severe disease resistant or relapsing. Uh, for the maintenance treatment, MMF is the first line, and then azathioprine is the uh, second line uh, to be used. And there, is, there are some emerging therapies, of course, including the most important ones among them are used more. Rituximab is basically used for more resistant, um, for resistant disease or refractory disease. Multi-target regimen, again, is also used for uh, refractory disease or more resistant disease. The clinical response criteria, there's a wide range of differences, but the one we rely more on is the protein and the creatinine, not the hematuria. And that's the difference between the nephrology and the rheumatology um, uh, definitions. And one thing important, for the long term, proteinuria, partial remission or complete remission, 
they correlate with better long-term outcomes. And in researches, including the follow-up of the Eurolupus nephritis uh, trial, Dominic says that proteinuria with protein excretion of less than 800 milligram at one year is the best predictor of long-term um, outcomes. It's not hematuria. Even the creatinine was not part of it. So, conclusion, proliferative lupus nephritis carries significant rate of unfavorable renal outcomes in Saudi population, 16% risk of chronic dialysis at medium follow-up of 48 months. And both cyclophosphamide and MMF are effective in inducing remission in proliferative ne lupus nephritis. Higher baseline chronicity on the biopsy is associated with less remission rate. MMF induction tends to improve the remission rate. In the long term, kidney survival is better with complete and partial remission as compared to a no remission. Thank you.